Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is the famous Dallas Range Master treble booster, a favorite of many guitarists such as Brian May of the band Queen. It turns out that the so-called treble booster is really nothing more than a standard common emitter amplifier that doesn't do a very good job of passing bass frequencies because of the capacitor at the input. Today's lecture is all about analyzing such circuits. So far in ECE 3400 analog electronics, we've treated capacitors as short circuits when doing small signal analysis of transistor amplifiers. This is the first of a series of lectures in which we'll treat the capacitors more carefully and look at their effect on the frequency response. In particular, here we're going to look at the effect of the capacitors at low frequencies because I personally think a lot about circuits in the context of music and audio in general. I think about this in terms of bass. This exposition assumes that you've seen my original lecture on common emitter amplifiers, so if you haven't watched that, you should go watch that and then come back. In that original lecture, we decompose the common emitter amplifier in terms of its DC bias circuit and its small signal, aka AC circuit. When performing the small signal analysis, we basically pretended that these capacitors acted as short circuits. Now, in that lecture, I didn't bother to give the capacitors names, but here I need to give them names. So I'll call the capacitor at the input C1, the capacitor at the output C2, and the capacitor down here at the emitter C3. In that lecture, we derived three different but equivalent formulas for the small signal voltage gain. We derived one that was focused on the activity happening at the collector, one focused on the activity occurring at the emitter, and one focused on the activity occurring at the base. But given some known relationships and a bit of algebra, you can derive any of these expressions from the other two. So in the original common emitter amplifier lecture, I called the voltage gain AV, and here I'm adding this infinity subscript to indicate that this is the gain at high frequencies. And in a practical sense, I should clarify that we're talking about frequencies that aren't too high. In a future lecture, I'll show you how parasitic capacitances can eat your lunch at very high frequencies. So the actual analysis we're doing in this lecture could be best described as what they would call mid-band. Capital RTB is the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking out of the base of the BJT. And these other quantities here are generally things that we compute based on other Thevenin equivalents looking out of various terminals and small signal parameters of the BJT. They are summarized on this monstrous slide here. So we have five different formulas to choose from for big GM. We have two formulas to choose from for little r ic, which is the equivalent resistance seen looking into the collector. rib is the equivalent resistance seen looking into the base. And rie is the equivalent resistance seen looking into the emitter. So rte is the equivalent resistance seen looking out of the emitter. Seeing all of these formulas at once can be really intimidating, but there's no fancy math going on here. It's just algebra. You can compute the numbers and plug them into your calculator. You can go to Marshall Leach's EC3050 Analog Electronics website. 3050 is an earlier number for 3400. Click on BJT Formula Sheet and find a bunch of these formulas summarized. They basically come from these Norton and Thevenin equivalent circuits we've been using throughout the course. Now, most of the formulas here are more complicated than anything we're actually using in this class because they involve r not the intrinsic resistance seen looking into the collector of the BJT, but we're mostly only using r not when we're calculating the resistance seen looking into the collector and we're assuming it's infinite in other contexts, so we have these simpler formulas. So it is perfectly possible to drive a transfer function that properly includes all three capacitors. It's painful, but it's possible. The resulting expression will have S-squared terms and S-cubed terms, and it will typically be a big mess that's hard to get any intuition about. I want to try to get some kind of understanding of what the capacitors are doing without having to slog through a ton of algebra. 
So for that, I'm going to apply an approximation called the method of short circuit time constants. And this is something you use when you do a low frequency analysis of a circuit. In a later lecture, when we focus on high frequencies, we'll use the method of open circuit time constants. So the idea here is we're going to look at each of the capacitors in turn, and when we're focusing on one of the capacitors, here C1, we're going to short the other two. This is essentially providing a worst-case analysis. Well, I should clarify worst-case from the standpoint of wanting a wide bandwidth amplifier. So here we're going to try to derive the effect of this capacitor in terms of computing the small signal voltage gain function that's now a function of frequency. So we're going to write this as a transfer function of a Laplace domain variable s, and you can plug in j omega for s in order to get the frequency response. Anyway, we're going to suppose that this transfer function is our original gain that we computed in the previous lecture times a transfer function resulting from the introduction of this capacitor that here I'm going to call h sub 1. In Marshall Leach's notes, he uses a capital T instead of H, and generally I try to stick with his notation, but I really don't like using T here, so I'm going to use H. The game we're always going to play is to look at the circuit and guess what the form of this transfer function should be. Well, at DC, at omega equals zero, C1 acts as an open circuit, so you get nothing out. Now, at very high frequencies, C1 acts as a short, and we should get our original A sub V infinity back. So we know that H1 needs to have the form of a canonical strict high-pass filter that's zero at DC and goes to one at infinity. And that has this kind of form when the frequency is expressed in terms of its reciprocal, a time constant. So in this method of short circuit time constants, we compute the time constant by shorting out the independent signal source driving the input. And then we imagine taking some wire clippers and clipping out the capacitor and replacing it with an ohmmeter to see the impedance scene looking out from where the capacitor was. So coming out of the left side of the capacitor, we would see RS, we would trace that down here to ground, and then we would find a bunch of resistances in parallel coming up from that ground back to the right side of the capacitor. And those resistances we see in parallel are R1, R2, but also RIB, the resistance scene looking into the base. And I have to be careful to remember to multiply by the capacitance C1. Now RIB is R pi, the raw input resistance of the BJT, plus 1 plus beta times RTE, which is the Thevenin equivalent resistance scene looking out of the emitter, which here is just RE in parallel with R3. If you had some other resistor capacitor configuration down here at the emitter to start with, you could replace RTE with whatever is appropriate. All right, so let's now focus on the capacitor at the output. So with the method of short circuit time constants, I'm going to short out C1 and short out C3. We see that we're going to have another canonical high pass filter form here because C2 is going to completely block DC. So to figure out what tau2 is according to the short circuit time constant method, we'll clip the capacitor here, measure the resistance seen looking out of this capacitor. So Going from the right, I could trace a path down through RL to ground, and then I would go from ground back up to the right side of C2 through two possible paths. One would be through RC, but I also have little rIC, so that would be the path coming out of the collector and up into the left side of the capacitor here. So those are gonna be in parallel. And I have to remember to multiply by C2. Remember when I'm computing the time constants, I'm deactivating this independent source here. We have two formulas we can use for RIC. This one is a little more compact than the other one, but you can use the other one if you want. And RTE here is again RE in parallel with R3, 
And again, if you had a different configuration of resistors and capacitor down here to start with, you could replace this with whatever's appropriate. Okay, so now let's focus on C3. This is a partial bypass capacitor. Now in the special case where R3 is zero, it's a full bypass capacitor, but we're assuming that we do have an R3 in here. So we're going to short C1 and short C2 according to the SCTC method. And this is going to be a bit more complicated to analyze. C3 is going to have a high shelf kind of filtering effect. So we're writing down this kind of transfer function here for it. And this constant out in front guarantees that as the frequency omega goes to infinity and these one pluses wind up not being so significant and what's happening over here winds up canceling out, these things wind up canceling and we wind up with this transfer function going to one at infinity so that our overall transfer function goes to A sub V infinity as we're expecting. To see that it's a high shelf function and not a low shelf function, remember you would get maximum gain if this is fully bypassed to ground. So having any emitter resistance at all lowers the gain and having more emitter resistance indicates even lower gain. So if we start out at very low frequencies, if C3 is effectively blocking R3, then you've got this full RE that's creating that emitter G generation that's lowering the gain. But as you increase the frequency and C3 is letting more and more current pass, R3 comes into play. It's now effectively in parallel with RE, effectively dropping your emitter degeneration resistance, hence increasing the gain. The shelving nature of this transfer function makes this more difficult to puzzle out than with the other capacitors that we looked at. And the way I'm going to approach this here is to actually remind ourselves of how we computed the gain in the previous lecture by focusing on the emitter current, i.e. So in general, if you're just focusing on the high frequency gain, I think focusing on the collector gives you a more natural solution. But for our current purposes, because we're thinking about this capacitor down here at the emitter, I think thinking about the emitter focus solution is the way to go. So to review, if we know the short circuit collector current associated with the Norton equivalent circuit seen looking into the collector, we could take that current and multiply it by the resistances seen by that current, namely RC, RL, and little rIC, which is the equivalent resistance seen looking into the collector. And we would want to put a minus sign here because the arrow indicates that we're pulling current out of the node. Now we could get that collector current from the emitter current by multiplying by alpha, and I should clarify that this expression comes from assuming the R0 approximation, i.e. assuming that R0 is infinity, otherwise we would have to worry about primes in here. But notice we're not using that R0 approximation when we're computing RIC, so that can get a little confusing. But using this R0 approximation over here and elsewhere makes our life a lot easier. So to get IE, we could use the Thevenin equivalent circuit for looking up into the emitter. And so that involves VTB, the Thevenin equivalent voltage seen looking out of the base, and RIE, which is a quantity that we can compute. So IE, by Ohm's law, is going to be VTB divided by RIE plus the impedance down here. So to fill this out, RIE is equal to RTB over 1 plus beta plus RE. RTB is that Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking out of the base. And to compute that, I would short out this voltage source and then say we would see R1 in parallel with R2 in parallel with RS all going to ground. VTB can be computed from this voltage divider that we've seen over and over. So for convenience, let me define this entire impedance here, this RIE in series with RE in parallel with R3 in series with C3. Let me define that whole thing as capital Z subscript E. So that's given here. So I could rewrite IE as VTB over ZE. So here's the main point. 
if you take this expression and this expression and this expression and this expression and pile them all together, the only thing that really has a frequency dependence in it is this reciprocal ZE here. So if we know the form of the transfer function we're looking for and are just trying to fill in the details, we can focus on ZE. To analyze this impedance, I'm going to use this handy RC impedance theorem from a couple of lectures ago. And this will get a little confusing because to use this theorem, I'm going to compute a short circuit time constant and an open circuit time constant. But this use of the term short circuit and this use of the term open circuit are different than the short circuit time constant method that I've been using all of this lecture and the open circuit time constant method I'm going to use for high frequency analysis in a future lecture. This is two different uses of the term short circuit time constant. Here, the short circuit time constant is the time constant we compute by taking one end of the impedance and shorting it to the other. And the open circuit time constant is the time constant we compute leaving the ends dangling. And our DC is the resistance at DC, which I can compute by opening up this cap, and that effectively takes R3 out of the circuit, and I just have RIE plus RE, this series combination. So I like to compute the open circuit time constant in this context first, because it's usually simpler to compute. If the ends are left dangling, RIE might as well not be there. And if I snip the wires here and snip that capacitor out and replace it with an ohmmeter, I'll just see R3 and RE in series. Now to get the time constant, I have to remember to multiply by C3. And the case for the short circuit time constant isn't much different. If I short out the ends here, then that RE is now in parallel with RIE. Now remember the goal. We wanted to compute our frequency-dependent transfer function as a constant, which we previously computed by just assuming all of the capacitors are shorts, times a shelving function, H3. And this shelving function is proportional to 1 over this impedance. If we remember the overall formula for the gain, it had a bunch of stuff in it, but most of it was not a function of frequency. This was the only thing that had a frequency dependence in it. So if I match things up here, I can say that what's in the denominator here matches with tau 3z, and what's in the numerator here matches with tau 3p, because remember I have a reciprocal here, so everything is flipped upside down. Now we do have this constant in front here to make sure that this transfer function is properly normalized. But an interesting thing to note is we didn't actually need RDC. This winds up washing out in the analysis. Now, we considered the capacitors one at a time, and for each capacitor, we computed a transfer function. And you might be tempted to just multiply those transfer functions together to incorporate the effects of all of the capacitors. But that usually doesn't work out very well. Remember that this was always an approximate analysis from the get-go. People will usually compute an aggregate cutoff frequency using this formula where you square all of the poles, and I here is an index over the various poles, and here we have the index over the various zeros. So this is not a typo. This isn't pi as in the Greek letter. Anyway, you square those, sum them up, and then you subtract twice what you get from summing up the squares of all the zero frequencies. And remember, you get the frequencies in radians per second for the poles and the zeros by taking the reciprocals of the associated time constants. And the square root of that gives you a worst-case lower cutoff frequency in that the actual cutoff frequency isn't going to be larger than what's given by this formula. And in practice, the highest pole frequency dominates this computation. Now for the common emitter amplifier we looked at, we had three poles, but just one zero. And I should remind you that omega is in terms of radians per second. If you want this in terms of hertz, you need to divide your result by two pi. Now, I've done this particular example because the common emitter amplifier is an important kind of amplifier, 
but I mostly did this as an example of a general technique that you could apply to other amplifier types. So you could apply this to common collector or to common bass or some of these multiple transistor amplifiers that we've looked at. The same kind of ideas would apply to all of them. Before we close out, I wanted to mention that if you wanted some more discussion about treble boost pedals, you could check out this lecture titled Trouble Boosters or Bass Tamers from my guitar amplification and effects class.